Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to this session on uh, the innovations in airway stem cell usage for studying chronic lung diseases. Um, I'm Ben Kopp from Nationwide Children's in Ohio State, and I'm pleased to be introducing our speaker today, uh, Finn Hawkins from Boston University. Uh, so Finn is an assistant professor of medicine, um, and he directs the ILD program at Boston Medical Center. He's also a principal investigator in the Center for Regenerative Medicine. Um, and Finn is really an expert in, in regenerative medicine and stem cell biology, um, and has some great innovative techniques um, uh, studying these fields and using lung organoids and developing lung organoids. So really excited for his talk today. He's gonna be talking about some of the, the recent innovations in this field and how we can better use um, these disease models to study uh, chronic lung diseases that span both uh, pediatric and adult disease. So I think it's one of the great aspects of this session is it's really applicable to, to all the researchers and clinicians out there. Um, and Finn, uh, with his medicine background, you know, always puts a good perspective on where we can take these research going forward. Um, so Finn is very well connected, has had some great mentoring in the past, and I think he has some slides to, to uh, recognize those folks that he's, he's worked with. Um, so I'll let him talk about those. Um, so a minute here, we're going to get started. Um, so um, please feel free to put your questions into the, the chat. Um, we will probably interrupt during the presentation with some questions and then we'll also have questions at the end. Um, you are all muted in the audience right now, but we're gonna have the ability at the end of the presentation if you would like to come on camera and ask some questions in person, we'll have that ability. Otherwise, um, if you want me to ask, just send it to me in the chat. Um, and then as a reminder, um, this session is being uh, recorded. So everyone, please be aware of that. Um, and then I will put a couple plugs um, you know, the Science and Innovation Center has um, continued uh, lectures like these uh, throughout the program. So please feel free to visit the website and check those out. Um, and then also a special note today is the, um, the basic and translational scientist reception at uh, 3.30. So please register for that if you haven't. That's a good chance to network virtually if we can. So I will turn it over to Finn. Thank you, Ben, for the uh, introduction. Welcome, everyone. It's nice to see some familiar names in the audience. I wish I, we were uh, there in person so I could say hello. Um, today, I'm going to be the title of my talk is um, Innovations in Airway Stem Cell Usage for Studying Chronic Lung Disease. And I'm just going to dive straight in. So, I don't have any conflicts to disclose. And at the very get go, I would like to. Uh, uh, acknowledge many of the uh, wonderful mentors, colleagues, collaborators, and uh, team members who've contributed to the work that I'm going to show you, including my mentor, Daryl Cotton. Much of the work I'm going to show you today um, was in close collaboration with Dr. Brian Davis and his uh, talented postdoc, uh, Shingo Suzuki, and uh, our collaborators, Steve Brody, Amjad Harani at WashU, and Scott Rundell um, at UNC. <clears throat> in terms of the title of the talk and uh, chronic lung diseases. For the purpose of today's talk, I'm gonna focus on three quite different diseases that affect both children and adults, cystic fibrosis, primary ciliary dyskinesia, and asthma. Um, but I'm going to have to get through some background first before we get to the disease modeling part. So the disease modeling will be in the latter part of the talk. Overall, my lab, uh, our overall mantra is that a better in vitro models will accelerate our understanding of lung diseases and ultimately translate into new therapies. And by better in vitro models, we think of uh, things uh, like uh, human, that the cells are human, that they can represent the unique genetic background of an individual or a patient group that we're interested in, and that they resemble as closely as possible the actual lungs and tissue of interest in terms of their cellular composition, biology, and how those cells work in concert with each other in terms of physiology. And from a practical perspective, it would be highly desirable that this is a pliable system that is scalable. So today's talk is broken up into uh, four sections. First, a very brief introduction to iPSC technology for those who are not that familiar with it. Uh, and then some brief background into the process of directed differentiation of iPSCs towards lung epithelium. 
I'll then spend the majority of the talk uh, discussing progress driving airway stem cells from iPS cells and their application to chronic uh, lung diseases. And if, if uh, that doesn't float your boat, the simple tagline for this is, if you wanna understand how a peripheral blood sample can be reprogrammed and ultimately give rise to an airway ciliated cell with functional beating cilia on its surface, uh, then uh, stick with us. So for the first part, a brief introduction to iPS cells for those who are not that familiar with the technology. So this is really a revolutionary technology that was first uh, discovered, described by Shinya Yamanaka in 2006, when he discovered that you could take somatic cells, in this example, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, but you can also use, for example, skin fibroblasts. You can take those cells and um, using viral vectors overexpress key transcription factors, uh, typically four transcription factors in those cells. And some of those cells will be reprogrammed into a cell that is highly similar to an embryonic stem cell. The transcription factors we typically use are OCT4, CMYK, KLF4, and SOX2, now referred to as the Yamanaka factors. And the cells that overexpress these uh, transcription factors and ultimately become completely reprogrammed into an embryonic stem cell-like uh, state are easily recognizable morphologically because they form these colonies that look highly similar to mouse and also human embryonic stem cells. Um, human embryonic stem cells are so-called because they are multipotent. They are able to differentiate into all three germ layers and the derivatives of those germ layers. A very simple uh, analysis of that ability is the teratoma assay. So we know in, in, uh, in medicine that teratomas are, are benign tumors formed of all three germ layers. And if you inject either embryonic stem cells or iPS cells into the flank of a mouse, it will form a teratoma. But that's a pretty crude assessment of the capacity of these cells. Probably the most impressive biological proof of the capacity of these cells is the following experiment. If you were to make iPS cells from a mouse that has a white fur coat and inject those iPS cells into the blastocyst of a mouse that has a gray or a gooty coat, you can see that the iPS cells actually contribute to organogenesis, including in the skin. And here are chimeric mouse, mice that are derived from the host with the donor iPS cells. And if you were to look in all the tissues of these mice, you would see iPS cells have actually functionally contributed to every, every organ. And so these iPS cells have now been derived from humans. Uh, when they are done, when that is done, they are specific to, you know, uh, to the genetic background from which they were derived. They can be derived in large numbers or expanded in large numbers. And in theory, uh, and why we are so interested in, in them is their capacity to differentiate into any cell type of interest if we can figure out the conditions to do so. And for that reason, they are a candidate for cell-based therapy and regenerative medicine. And just last year, we had the, uh, a report of iPSC-derived dopaminergic neurons being transplanted into a human patient with Parkinson's. So I think we're really at the forefront of this technology. And this, um, this technology gives rise to the overall schematic for using these cells in lung disease that we can generate iPS cells from any patient of interest with an acquired or genetic lung disease, generate iPS cells so that we have a near limitless supply of those cells for downstream studies. And if we could differentiate those cells into lung cell types of interest, we could perform disease modeling, drug screens, possibly eventually have a cell-based therapy. So I'm now going to introduce the concept of directed differentiation and how this applies to towards uh, generating lung epithelial cells. Uh, essentially, directed differentiation refers to the process by which in vitro iPS cells or ES cells are coaxed towards a tissue uh, type of interest by trying to recapitulate the key developmental milestones that would occur in vivo. And that is done through the addition um, of exogenous growth factors or inhibitors of signaling pathways at specific time points. Um, and so for the lung, we have this very reductionist approach. Um, and this is the most basic roadmap we could write for ourselves of how an iPS cell might actually get to a mature lung epithelial cell type. Um, our iPS cells are akin to the uh, 
pluripotent cells in the inner cell mass of the blastocyst embryo. And as they differentiate and go through gastrulation, uh, definitive endoderm is the first major milestone we want to achieve. The lung will derive from this definitive endoderm, and it is identified by many different uh, genes and markers shown here, the transcription factors, FOXA2 and SOX17. But ultimately, the lung will first develop and first be identified in the ventral foregut endoderm, identified by just a handful of cells that express this key transcription factor, NKX2-1. So if you bear with me, this is one of the few genes I'll ask you to remember because it's essential for the remainder of the talk. NKX2-1 is shown here in this uh, picture of a mouse, uh, an NKX2-1 GFP mouse, and you can see the GFP fluorescence in the lung domain, but also in the forebrone brain domain because NKX2-1 is not specific to the lung, it is also ex expressed in the forebrain, and too small to be seen on this image, it is also expressed in the thyroid. But we are really uh, captivated by this transcription factor in these cells because uh, in the developing mouse and presumably in the developing human, those very first few cells that start to express NKX2-1 ultimately give rise to all the cell types that form the proximal airways and the distal, distal alveolar epithelial cells. So if you could derive these cells in vitro from iPS cells, uh, in theory, that, that cell population would have the potential to form all the airway and alveolar epithelial cells relevant to disease modeling. And so I'm going to just briefly review some published work before moving on to our more recent work to describe how we ultimately um, achieved lung differentiation. Here is a picture of a human lung at week 10 showing you that NKX2-1 is also expressed very early in, in during human fetal lung development. So to identify lung progenitors from iPS cells, we actually took a similar approach to this mouse I'm showing you. And using an iPSC line, we used uh, CRISPR and gene editing technology to insert a green fluorescent protein sequence into the NKX2-1 locus without interfering with transcription or translation of NKX2-1. I'll spare the details of the, the, the targeting because it's been published. But then using this fluorescent reporter iPSC line, we differentiated it uh, through three key stages to try and um, specify cells towards lung, uh, a lung lineage. I will summarize this quite briefly because it's been published, but essentially in the first stage, we differentiate cells towards definitive endoderm in now well-established, highly efficient protocols to do so. The definitive endoderm is then patterned over the following three days towards a more foregut endoderm state, state by inhibiting uh, TGF beta and BMP4 signaling as described by Hans Schnuck in his lab. Subsequently, that foregut endoderm is treated with some key activators of signaling pathways that are known to be essential for lung development, including Wnt, BMP4, and retinoic acid. And so when we apply this protocol to this reporter iPSC line, we do indeed see the emergence of cells that express NKX2-1 GFP as demonstrated here by flow cytometry, but we can also visualize them real time under the microscope. And this video that I'm just briefly going to show you is one of the key videos from my, uh, my time in the lab under the mentorship of Daryl Cotton, where working for many years on this project, we uh, performed this time series video over about 24 hours of organoids after two weeks in this differentiation protocol. And you can see there are already some areas that are expressing GFP, but over this 24 hours, if you look in this area here, for example, you will see the emergence of cells expressing GFP. And so at the time we speculated and hoped that what we were seeing was actually the moment of specification of a lung epithelial program in human cells. And I think our subsequent work and work by others confirmed that this is actually indeed the case. Okay, so I'm just gonna pause here to critically mention that um, this field has dramatically advanced over the last decade since the first initial reports. And to briefly summarize the initial uh, papers describing progress towards generating lung epithelial cells, um, we're really generating quite immature um, uh, lung epithelial cells. And now over the, the subsequent 10 years, we've seen the field move to increasingly sophisticated protocols that generate mature and functional lung epithelial cells. Um, and I want to acknowledge the, the many groups that have contributed to that progress here. 
I will also pause just to say that from the data that I've shown you, there are some important, um, important issues to be aware of. So the cells that I showed you are very immature. They're essentially the most immature lung cells that we know of. And part of the reason is that we do not have a precise roadmap of the exact signals and timing uh, in order to generate the full complement of mature uh, lung epithelial cells. Um, also, the, the technology has not been broadly, uh, broadly, uh, broadly applied yet. And I think that's mainly because uh, of issues with the complexity, the length and the cost of these um, differentiation protocols. And I'll also just briefly mention that we, we know early on in this protocol, there's actually still lineage plasticity. And, that's some, and that even though these lung epithelial cells may emerge early in the wrong conditions, they can uh, differentiate into other cell types. However, despite those concerns, I hope to show you by the end of the talk that we have made significant progress in overcoming many of these issues. So now onto the uh, main part of my talk, which will focus on airway stem cells and their derivation from iPS cells. We've talked about pluripotent stem cells, uh, which can, by definition, differentiate into all three germ layers. But I'm now going to talk about adult or tissue-specific stem cells, an entirely different uh, category of stem cell. These are specific to an organ or tissue, and they play essential roles in maintaining the organ in question during homeostasis and in response to injury. And in general, there's great interest in, in understanding how tissue-specific stem cells are specified during development and maintained in, during adulthood. And from a regenerative medicine perspective, can we actually generate tissue-specific stem cells de novo? Basal cells are the stem cell of the airways in mice and humans, as demonstrated by numerous investigators at this point. This image is from uh, uh, Rick Boucher's recent publication, but essentially here I'm showing you a human uh, airway where we see this thick pseudostratified epithelium and along the basement membrane here we see these wedge-shaped cells and these are the airway basal cells and to summarize over a decade of work it is now conclusive that basal cells can self-renew um, and under appropriate conditions can differentiate into all the cell types of the um, adult airways including club cells, multiciliated cells, goblet cells and the rarer neuroendocrine tuft and ionocytes. And it's these uh, features that earn it the uh, definition of a tissue specific stem cell. And these molecular properties translate into some very highly practical properties relevant to research, including the ability to expand um, primary basal cells in vitro and under appropriate conditions that are now well established, differentiate those cells into a pseudostratified airway epithelium that has really been essential for disease modeling, for example, in cystic fibrosis. So the question is, can you make basal cells from iPS cells? And the broader question for the, um, for the regenerative medicine field is, is it possible to make a tissue specific stem cell from an iPS cell? And our affectionate name for this um, project in the lab for the last few years is the stem cell from a stem cell project. So before we dive into the iPSC side of things, I just want to go through one or two background slides on the primary cells to better understand them and how they will inform our iPSC studies. So primary basal cells, frequently referred to as human bronchial epithelial cells or HBECs, can be differentiated in air liquid interface culture into a pseudostratified airway epithelium. In the center of this slide here, you can see an on fast image of those differentiated cells, where in green, we're marking the cilia on the apical surface of multiciliated cells, and in magenta, the secretory cells are staying from mucinthia. And you can see this front of multiciliated cells with interspersed secretory cells, typical of high quality ALI cultures. In this, in preparation for these experiments, we profiled these cells using single cell RNA sequencing, both the basal cells and the differentiated cultures. And as expected, and as others have published, we detected the cell types you would expect to see in these differentiated cultures, including multiciliated, secretory, basal, and ionocytes. But the point of this slide is to explain that we used this single cell RNA-seq data set to generate gene signatures for each of these cell types. Essentially, the top 30 to 50 genes expressed in each of these cell types compared to their companions so that we could benchmark 
our iPSC-derived cells during the development of the iPSC-derived basal cell technology. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to summarize a couple of years of work before getting to the basal cell project. I already explained that in the first 14 to 16 days, we generate these immature lung progenitors identified by the expression of NKX2-1 that using this reporter line can be visualized, tracked, quantified, and purified. We subsequently determined that uh, manipulating a single key signaling pathway was essential in patterning the cells towards a more proximal airway phenotype versus a distal alveolar phenotype. And so in the absence of Wnt, activity, these NKX2-1 positive cells now form spheroids that are composed of cells consistent with an immature airway phenotype. And when we do performed single cell RNA sequencing on these airway organoids, we found a population of cells that expressed the transcription factor P63 and keratin-5. And so the second gene I would really like you to remember is P63, which is the key transcription factor in basal cells. So with this data, we were very excited to know whether we actually had a bona fide population of basal cells within our cultures. So to, to do so, um, we took a similar approach to the NKX2-1 reporter, and we wanted to generate a basal cell reporter. And so we had to select the ideal uh, combination of markers to, to identify those cells. And we selected a second marker as P63 to target. Um, here, I'm just showing you on the left, this is the roadmap inferred from uh, studies of human embryos at different developmental stages, suggesting that P63 is detected quite early in human fetal lungs at about week seven, and quite prior to more established basal cell markers. On the right, I'm showing you a section of human, of human lung tissue where you can clearly see the expression of NKX2-1 and P63 in the basal cells just above the basement membrane. So using that reporter line I previously introduced, we actually took a similar approach of gene editing and introduced a tomato sequence, so a different color fluorofluor into the P63 locus. And I'll spare you the details because they've been uh, published, but the overall concept here is that if we have established that we can generate these immature lung progenitors, with this new dual fluorescence reporter, uh, as basal cell emerge from these NKX2-1 positive cells, we hope uh, we will start to see the emergence of TD tomato positive cells. And indeed, that's what we saw. So the question is, are these basal cells? Well, this reporter is very convenient. We can track um, the expression of these two fluorophores over time. And as you can see here on day zero, using flow cytometry, at day zero, none of the cells are co-expressing our two transcription factors of interest. At day 15, most of the cells are actually expressing NKX2-1, but very few expressing P63. But di by day 35, actually, we have a nice discrete population. About a quarter of the cells are expressing both fluorophores. So are these basal cells? Well, Essentially, we do not think that these are mature basal cells. When these cells were placed in ALI, they would frequently fail, or at best, they would form patchy um, areas of differentiation, as shown in one of the better images down here. Compared to the primary cells uh, to the right of this image, you can see that these cultures seemed uh, inferior. So we set out to understand um, how to improve the differentiation and maturation of these cells. And we did a surprising, we did an experiment with surprising results. We wondered whether placing these cells in the well-established primary basal cell medias might expand a population of basal cells if they existed in the cultures. So the thought being here, if indeed there were some few rare mature basal cells, perhaps in this media, we would be able to expand them. So in, I'll talk you through this experiment. We take our uh, airway organoids, and we either continue them in our standard media, which uh, has the lengthy abbreviation of FGF2 plus 10 plus DCI plus Y, or we treated them with a medium that's well established for primary basal cell expansion and is commercially available as pneumocult expansion media. And we supplemented this with two inhibitors of SMAD signaling. And this was described by Hong Mei Mu five years ago, where she identified that inhibition of SMAD signaling was essential in maintaining basal cells from different tissues. 
we followed these cells over the following weeks and you can see morphologically some, some changes emerged, but in terms of expression of our two fluorophores, they were pretty robustly maintained in both conditions. But the striking observation was that the surface marker NGFR, which is a well-established surface marker of basal cells, was not, was not expressed in our standard conditions, but in basal cell medium was, was, was um, expressed robustly. That's quantified here. And so we next performed a time series analysis after exposing cells to basal cell medium. And you can see that rapidly in response to basal cell medium, we see this upregulation of NGFR in blue here. And by day four, over 50% over of the cells have upregulated NGFR in response to the change in media. So we performed single cell RNA sequencing, comparing these two conditions to understand how they're different. And here you can see a UMAP plot where each dot represents an individual cell. And here in this first plot, they're identified by which media they were in. And uh, in salmon color is the standard old media conditions. And in blue or turquoise is the newer basal cell medium conditions. And you can see that the cells pretty much segregate mostly depending on which media they were in. We then performed Louvain clustering and we looked at the genes expressed in these discrete populations. I'm showing you a handful of basal cell genes and a secretory gene here, just to help you understand these populations. But we applied the gene signatures that we generated from the primary cells to these populations. And we were particularly interested in population one, which is in the basal cell medium, which expresses P63, robustly expresses NGFR, and also some keratin-5. And when we look at an enrichment score for that signature of primary basal cells, we can see indeed population one is, uh, is clearly uh, has the highest enrichment for these genes. And that's just visualized here on these UMAPs where we see population one expresses the highest level of the basal cell signature. And we have small populations of secretory and ciliated cells based on those signatures also. So I go back to my prior question, are these basal cells? And I'm gonna go through some functional analyses to answer that question. First, in one of my favorite experiments, we did a limiting dilution, a clonal assay in using the tracheosphere assay. So to explain the details, we took individual iPSC-derived putative basal cells that express our two fluorophores, indicating P63 and NKX2-1 expression, but also NGFR. And we plated them in three-dimensional culture conditions at a very low density, so that we were confident that a single cell was giving rise to a single sphere. We trained, changed those cells to an airway differentiation media, and then we used immunofluorescent staining to assess for evidence of self-renewal, looking for a single basal cell giving rise to multiple new basal cells, and also for multi-lineage differentiation by assessing for evidence of multiciliated cells by looking at acetylated tubulin or secretory cells. And in, you can see in the single sphere, we see evidence that uh, uh, suggests that these cells fulfill the criteria for an a basal cell, an airway stem cell, because we clearly see numerous basal cells oriented around the periphery of this organoid. And we see secretory cells identified by CC10 expression. And we see ciliated cells, the cilia oriented to the inner lumen of these spheres. So the next question is, well, how do these cells behave in standard air liquid interface differentiations? And so this is now our working protocol where airway organoids are generated in basal cell medium. We get the emergence of cells that express classic basal cell markers. And the question now is when those cells are placed in air liquid interface culture, how do they perform? So this image is actually showing you an entire transwell, a 6.5 millimeter transwell, and we're looking on FAS soon after plating where you can see the endogenous P63 TD tomato fluorescence identifies a lawn of cells uh, at the initiation of culture. And then two weeks later, we actually see a lawn of green. Um, and here we're looking at acetylated tubulin, so suggesting a lawn of ciliated cells, but this is a small little insert zoomed very, very far out. Let's zoom in and you can now see a much more confluent lawn of ciliated cells with interspersed secretory cells. We'll zoom in again to give you a better appreciation that this is a much improved mucociliary epithelium compared to prior. If we look at a sagittal section through the epithelium, we see some organization 
a pseudostratified appearing epithelium with basal cells marked in green along, along the filter equivalent to the basement membrane as would be expected. And oriented into the um, air are the ciliated cells with cilia on the surface here. We wanted a more unbiased assessment than just relying on a handful of uh, uh, antibody markers. So we performed single cell RNA sequencing of these cultures. And we clearly saw clusters of cells that were highly similar to secretory, ciliated, immature ciliated, and basal cells. I'm just showing you some of the expression patterns on this UMAP of some of the classic basal cell, secretory cell, and multiciliated cell markers. And we were uh, very happy to see that, uh, despite what I mentioned earlier about plasticity and imprecise protocols in, in these analyses, we saw virtually no non-lung cells. We applied our signatures that I described earlier to these cells, and you can see they nicely identify the basal, secretory, and multiciliated populations. And then just in a much simpler comparison, we compared the uh, mRNA of iPSC-derived cells to primary HBEX in similar conditions for standard airway genes. And for the most part, we saw broadly similar gene expression. I will mention the one exception is the secreted globin 3A2, which is much higher in our cells than in primary airway cells and may indicate a more immature secretory phenotype or possibly a more distal. One of the really uh, practical surprises of this protocol and advantages is the ability to culture these iPSC-derived basal cells for extended periods. So here I'm showing you the P63 fluorescence of these spheres in their three-dimensional culture format, but actually even after three months of in vitro passaging, in this platform, when placed in ALI, they maintained the capacity to differentiate into multiciliated cells and secretory cells. And we now have developed robust, um, efficient protocols to cryopreserve these cells um, at the iBasal cell stage. Uh, I'm gonna refer to these cells as iPSC derived basal cells or iBasal cells from this point forward. And they freeze and thaw efficiently, which uh, is a major practical uh, advantage in terms of not having to start a protocol for every experiment. And this was uh, some cells that we shared with our collaborator, Scott Randell, and he took this beautiful video of a mucus hurricane in iPSC-derived uh, airway epithelium. And so this is uh, coordinated cilia beating, uh, debris and mucus at the apical surface of a transwell generated from iPSC-derived airway cells. I know that's been a rapid review of the technology and the progress in deriving airway stem cells um, from iPSCs. I'm now going to change gears and focus on how we might use this technology to study chronic lung diseases. I'll go back to the three diseases I said I would, uh, I would highlight uh, at the beginning, cystic fibrosis, primary dyskinesia, and asthma. Uh, very different diseases with unique research challenges and questions. And I'm certainly not suggesting that iPS cells are the unique solution to these questions, but I do think there are uh, unique select questions that the iPSC platform might be well suited to address within these disease fields. So let's start with asthma. And uh, asthma is, a, of course, a very interesting disease that affects both children and adults. And one interesting feature is the, the role of the airway epithelium as you know, really a, a sentinel tissue in terms of asthma pathogenesis, which forms part of this complex interplay between genes and environment. Studying the epithelium in humans has been quite challenging, but there are some um, important questions. This is a, this is a classic image uh, that's shown of the juxtaposition of an asthmatic airway beside a normal airway with the uh, mucus metaplasia, increased intraluminal mucus, the thickening of the basement membrane and lamina propria, with the accumulation of extracellular matrix and the smooth muscle hyperplasia that are characteristic of the airway remodeling seen in asthma. And some of the questions, simple questions of why do certain individuals, uh, why are they susceptible to asthma? And what mechanisms drive the epithelial response that lead to airway remodeling? I'm just gonna talk you through a single simple experiment that we did in terms of trying to understand whether the IPSC platform which is this you know, somewhat artificial in vitro platform where we're dealing with cells that months previously or years previously were actually circulating as peripheral blood mononuclear cells in a human. So do we actually 
detect an asthma phenotype in some of the more standard asthma assays that have been developed. And so we treated iPSC-derived cells with the Th2 inflammatory cytokine IL-13 and asked the simple question, is, metaplasia, is mucous metaplasia induced, similar as you would expect to see in primary cells or in animal models? And so on the top panel, we have the control versus the IL-13 stimulated on the bottom. And you can see visually that if we look at the acetylated tubulin, there may be a decrease in acetylated tubulin, and there's a su suggestion of more MUC5AC positive cells in the IL-13 treated. When we quantify this, we did indeed see a significant increase in the number of MUC5AC positive cells, and the gene expression changes in response to IL-13 were consistent consistent with what's classically being described to occur in the airway epithelium in response to IL-13 treatment, namely an increase in MUC5AC, a decrease in mucin 5 b and an increase in SPED-F. And so I think this uh, experiment is at least proof of concept of the potential of iPSCs to be used to study um, uh, airway epithelium. And I think there's probably a particular interest in studying the effect of genetics and genetic variants on susceptibility to asthma using this unique model. Cystic fibrosis is, uh, I think, a great example of a disease that really is at the uh, forefront and a success story in terms of developing effective, precise therapies um, in the lung field. Uh, yet there are some key uh, remaining uh, issues. As we know, cystic fibrosis is a monogenic disease, um, but hundreds of mutations in the CFTR gene have been described. And the type of mutation can lead to a distinct defect in CFTR function, which can lead to differences in disease severity, and very importantly, have a major impact on the drug ability of those patients. And so this is an image just showing you the, uh, the CF locus with some of the more common mutations. And uh, this is a very busy slide, but I wanted to highlight three you know, of the better known mutations that are representative of different classes of cystic fibrosis mutations. And so uh, we have here class three or four mutations. Uh, and the example in the image on the left is G551D. In this case, these mutations lead to normal amounts of CFTR protein at the apical surface. However, the function is decreased, and these tend to be uh, milder um, cases of cystic fibrosis. Class one and class two are more severe. In class two, the classic example is of the Delta 508 mutation, which is obviously a misfolding defect. But class one are, I'd really like to draw your attention to. These are typically premature termination codon mutations that lead to um, a premature termination and essentially little to no functional protein. And so those patients do not respond to the modulator therapy that is now you know, looking very, very promising for the class two mutations, which have a little amount of protein and these class one mutation individuals represent a major, major hurdle in the field for which there's an urgent need to identify effective therapies, be they pharmacological, which will require pretty complex approaches, uh, gene editing, or maybe even someday cell-based therapies. So how could the IPC platform be helpful in the world of cystic fibrosis? Well, we wanted to start with a simple experiment and ask whether um, whether cystic fibro whether the iPSC platform could be used in the classic Ussing chamber assay uh, and be used to detect CFTR dependent current. And so this uh, work was led by Dr. Ruby Wang, who was uh, working with myself and Dr. Cotton at the time, and is uh, now moving back to Children's Hospital in Boston. But here's the experiment. So we had previously generated iPS cells from a patient homozygous for the Delta 508 mutation. And we previously published that uh, that mutation was corrected. Um, and so now we're left with a pair of iPS cells from the same individual that are genetically identical, except for one carries the defective uh, CFTR sequence and the other carries the normal sequence. We differentiated both those iPSC lines into airway epithelium and performed an Ussing chamber analysis. And so the Ussing chamber analysis is the classic measure, electrophysiologic measure of CFTR function or of ion channel function in general. 
And I'll, so I'll briefly talk you through this. I'm going to refer to this, the delta 508 airway epithelium as CF airway epithelium. And here we're measuring a short circuit current across this airway epithelium as we inhibit or activate um, ion channels. So first ENAC is inhibited with amylaride, and you can see there's no change in the short circuit current. And then we add forsklin, which should activate cystic fibre, which should activate CFTR. And here you can see that in response to forsklin, there's really no, no activation of CFTR. However, in the corrected epithelium, we see a robust CFTR dependent current that's induced in response to forsklin and inhibited in response to CFTR inhibitor 172. And to us, this was uh, very exciting data, um, not least because the range of, or the magnitude of CFTR dependent current was similar to what's been published in primary human bronchial epithelial cells. And that primary human bronchial epithelial cell platform is really, uh, has been essential in the drug development of CFTR modulators. So that's, uh, that's using gene correction, but what about detecting actual modulator response. Um, so in this straightforward experiment, uh, Dr. Andrew Barakal, who's a junior faculty in my lab, has been uh, spearheading uh, this project. And um, this graph is a simple experiment where Delta 508 homozygous iPS cells were differentiated in airway epithelium and treated with various combinations of the older and newer CFTR modulators. The simple question for this experiment is, to what extent can we detect clinically relevant rescue of CFTR current in iPSC derived cells? And as you can see in the red bar here, treated with the newer generation of CFTR modulators, we see actually a pretty robust CFTR dependent current in this Delta 508 homozygous sample, suggesting that yes, indeed, the iPSC platform has the potential to detect clinically relevant um, uh, rescue of CFTR modulators. But that's kind of uh, going over old ground. The real future is uh, how do we address these class one mutations that need much more uh, ambitious approaches? And so we wanted to ask the relatively simple question, if we take iPS cells from one of these class one mutations, can we detect any evidence of CFTR rescue using some of these newer emerging uh, experimental uh, approaches? And so Andrew has been working hard over the last couple of years and during his fellowship to adapt the uh, rectal organoid swelling assay developed by uh, Hans Klevers and Jeffrey Beekman, in which rectal organoids can be treated with forsklin, and the forsklin will lead to swelling if CFTR is present. That swelling can be quantified and correlates directly with the amount of CFTR and it's used as a very useful readout for severity in a CF and response to modulators. And so Andrew's been trying to use that in the iPSC field with the logic that targeting these very rare mutations might be uh, accelerated using iPS cells. And so here's iPS cell derived airway spheroids being treated with forsklin. And you can see over time, these individual spheres increasing in size. And there's a lot more work that I could show you on this, but just in the essence of uh, time, I'm going to skip to the key experiment where we then took W1282X, so a class one mutation, a patient homozygous for that mutation, and treated those, um, those spheres with a combination of experimental compounds. And briefly, the pharmacotherapy, there are no, there are no uh, effective treatments for these patients, but you know, current studies are focused on a complex multifaceted approach, which includes trying to achieve read-through of the premature termination codon. So here we're using G418, an aminoglycoside, to try and achieve a level of read-through. These premature transcripts are rapidly uh, decayed by, uh, uh, by nonsense-mediated decay. So here we're using an inhibitor of the SMIG1 pathway. And we're also treating these cells with uh, modulators and potentiators. And uh, in this unpublished data, I'm showing you the exciting results that Andrew had, which was when you have the combination of inhibition of NMD and a read-through agent and the three, um, three modulator potentiator compounds, he actually detected a small but significant CFTR-dependent swelling. Okay, so one more disease to go. <laughs> um, 
So primary ciliary dyskinesia is the third disease we're going to speak about, and it's, um, it's a very different disease, despite some similarities in clinical presentation to CF. And I, one of the main things I'd like to highlight that is in contrast to CF, which is monogenic, uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia is, uh, involves mutations in multiple genes, up to 40 of the genes that are required to assemble uh, the cilia and for proper ciliary function. And so can the IPSC system be used to actually model defects in primary ciliary dyskinesia? And so the idea here was we, um, in collaboration with Amjad Harani and Steve Brody, uh, they identified a patient with one of the more common PCD causing mutations in uh, DNA H5. And we generated iPS cells from this patient and we generated air liquid interface cultures from those cells. We compared it to healthy control and actually very graciously, the family um, and the patient agreed to supply nasal epithelial cells for this uh, experiment also. And so this, was, uh, this is an on-fast image of the ALI cultures from the patient uh, themselves, the iPSCs. This was a very exciting image for me because uh, I typically spend way too much time at the microscope looking at these cultures as they're differentiating, obsessing over the beating ciliated cells, which I love to look at, and of course, in this experiment, I thought we had failed because I couldn't see any evidence of beating whatsoever, but of course that's to be expected. Uh, and in fact, the immunostaining confirmed that we have uh, very normal looking uh, cilia. Um, a more careful examination of the cells. So just to explain the controls here, we've just got a wild type HBEC control, primary control. We've got the patient's actual nasal cells here on the second row. We've got our wild type iPSC control here, and we've got the patient's iPSC cells down here. And we're staining for tubulin in the second column. So you can see all cells, this is an individual cell here. All, all of these cells have apical multicilia, but of course in our patient and in their iPSCs, we do not have any detectable DNA H5 protein to be expected. And then this is transition, uh, transmission electron microscopy and it shows the classic but subtle finding that in the patient, you lose the small comma sign, the little comma, comma that is uh, the outer dynein arms, which you can actually see here in red on the uh, non-affected cells is missing on the patient cells, be they iPSC or primary. This is simply quantified here that we didn't really detect any outer dynein arms uh, in the mutant samples and the ciliary beat frequency was ab absent zero in the PCD samples. And um, uh, this is best understood if you can actually see the video of these cells. So in the next slide, I'm gonna show you a video of all four samples. So here's the healthy control. You can see robust cilia beating. Here's the parent. You can see this more sluggish cilia beating. And here in the actual patient cells and the, and the iPSC cells, despite long morphologically normal appearing cilia, they are not, they are not beating. So we really hope that given the genetic diversity of PCD, the private nature of some of the mutations uh, and the lack of any precise uh, effective therapies like exist for CF that the iPSC platform might help accelerate research in this area. So we've talked about three different diseases, but to just close, I'm gonna talk about the potential long-term uh, this is science and innovation, so this might be the science fiction aspect of, of, uh, of the talk. The potential to actually cure these diseases if you had an effective, safe based therapy. And this is, of course, a way off. But we're seeing examples in other disciplines of, of this approach being effective. And of course, hematopoietic stem cell transplants have been um, a, a really amazing. Um, revolution in, in hematology. So could you actually achieve uh, airway regeneration with iPSC-derived basal cells that ultimately you might be able to achieve autologous cell-based therapies for genetic airway diseases? I'm just gonna show you one experiment that we did with uh, Shingo Suzuki and Brian Davis to try and assess whether this was even feasible. And it's very challenging to get lungs to engraft in the, to get, excuse me, cells to engraft in the lungs of animals and so we actually used an established approach that's called the tracheal xenograft model, described a couple of decades ago at this point. And this is where you take a rodent rat trachea, repeatedly cryo flash freeze it to kill all the uh, endogenous cells. Then you um, 
then you introduce your cells of interest into the uh, lumen of the trachea. And after a brief culture period, it's actually transplanted back into a mouse. And it's transplanted into the back of the mouse under the skin. So it's in vivo, it's not in the lungs, but it's in vivo and tubing connects it to the outside environment. So it's a hybrid model where you have the advantage of being in vivo and you get exposure to air, but it's also not uh, truly engraftment into the lung. So we took our iPSC derived basal cells and in this uh, rodent xenograft model, we transferred our cells and after three weeks, we were pretty astounded and delighted to see um, an airway epithelium had formed, a pseudostratified airway epithelium, clearly with ciliated cells. I'm um, just showing you the zoomed in here and here you can see the more broad epithelium. And when we stain for our standard markers of ciliated in green here or basal in red here, we saw organization of the epithelium as you would hope to see in a normal airway epithelium. And we saw the expected cell types of ciliated secretory cells. And here I'm showing you, this was with the dual fluorescence reporter line I introduced. So you can see that the epithelium is actually composed of our, our donor cells as opposed to host cells. So cell-based therapies is a long way off, but uh, on the one hand, this was um, very rewarding to see that these cells could differentiate in this somewhat in vivo format. And perhaps someday um, with progress from multiple groups, we might actually achieve uh, real airway regeneration. So in summary, um, uh, I've explained our progress in deriving airway stem cells or basal cells from iPS cells. These cells can self-renew in vitro uh, extensively. Uh, this says over 150 days. We've since uh, increased that number to almost a year. And they can be efficiently cryopreserved, so it's now a tractable toolbox for studying human lung diseases, particularly um, uh, interesting for genetic lung diseases. And I've shown you proof of concept studies showing our ability to apply this platform to, to study primary ciliary dyskinesia, cystic fibrosis, asthma, and the potential for these cells to regenerate an airway epithelium in the tracheal xenograft model. I would uh, if you are interested in some of this work, uh, some of it was uh, recently published in Cell Stem Cell just this January past for more details on the disease modeling aspects of it. I would once again like to thank all the collaborators, uh, mentors, team members who uh, assisted in, uh, in this work. And I will pause there and hope there's some questions that I'd be happy to have discussion all right. Thank you, Finn. That was an excellent talk. It's really fascinating to see the evolution of the technology and, and where we can go with this and a variety of diseases moving forward. Um, so we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, again, as a reminder, you can put those in the, the chat um, and I'll ask those. And then I think uh, Mei Ling was going to try to get this open so we could have live questions as well. So Finn, one of the questions is something we've talked about in the past. You know, have you tried to put these iPSCs in the presence of other cell types, you know, perhaps to see how like cell to cell communication might impact different? Yeah, so the, I think for immune cells and, and how that might better model um, lung diseases of interest. Um, we, we have started working on that. I think that's where the field is uh, strongly moving towards. There's really nice examples in, um, in some of the other iPSC fields, for example, the intestine where you have, uh, you have multi-lineage organoids that include not just intestinal epithelium, but, but, um, but mesenchymal components and even um, neural components. I think in the lung, there's a lot of interest in trying to understand the interaction of immune cells with the airway and alveolar epithelial cells. And so I think uh, there has not been much published progress in that yet, but I think that's one of the next frontiers for our, our field. You know, along those lines, you know, part of this is looking at therapeutics and how they can impact, you know, um, and how you can design therapeutics and test therapeutics in this model. But, um, you know, is there a role during the differentiation process for medications that, you know, patients might be exposed to and how they might impact differentiation? Or even um, if we think about in CF, where we've seen that, you know, adding back airway supernatants to, you know, cells and culture can impact their they're signaling, you know, is there a role for that during the actual differentiation? Well, that's a really interesting question. And I hadn't really thought about that before. I guess one, one part of it could simply um, be interpreted 
as could you use this model to understand if medications in general can cause developmental defects? And um, I think the answer is yes, although I'm not really aware of, um, of how well that's been developed. Um, in terms of your second question, tree, could you elaborate on the second part of the question a bit more just so I fully understand? Um, so I guess, you know, if we've seen with um, a lot of the immune studies in, in cystic fibrosis and even studies with the area epithelium, when you add back in, um, you know, patient factors such as an airway supernatant, you know, that contains inflammatory signals and things that might be present in some of these chronic diseases, it, it impacts the signaling and, and the function, you know, of cells just in culture, you know, because you have the sterile environment. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, does that have a role too in the differentiation for these diseases that are genetic? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Yes, I think there's multiple sides to that. We could spend a long time discussing it. We, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I mean, I think on the one hand, an obvious criticism of the IPSC platform is it's very reductionist and it's missing key cell types and it's missing key environmental exposures. Uh, on the flip side, that's the precise advantage is uh, uh, if it's used in complementary approaches with other established platforms and animal models, it can really actually provide a unique, you know, environment-free, immune-free system to try and study some of those things. So, yeah, I think there could be plenty of um, potentially exciting studies where you could use an iPSC-derived airway that's essentially naive to immune cells or inflammation and, and study in a quite defined way how, how things change in response to an inflammatory mediator of interest or a certain pathogen of interest. Um, because I think one of the big issues in our field is that with primary cell samples, it's so hard to disentangle it from the environment of the individual. Uh, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a challenge and there's a lot of exciting areas to go through. So uh, another question from the audience. Um, mentioned the great reconstitution of the graft trachea with donor cells. I think that that latest data you're talking about at the end. Um, so how might you model a therapeutically minded denudation of the trachea? Um, so if you're denuding the trachea in C2 and then prior to replacement with donor cells. Well, I see that's from Malar. Um, yeah, I would love to hear if anyone else has any ideas, but um, in terms of thinking about cell-based therapies, we have quite a long way to go. And I think most of our models for airway injuries, there's really only a, a couple and they're pretty, pretty crude. But um, I mean, there's, it, it can be from as simple as, as bronchoscopically using a brush and, and making a very mild injury to, you know, more sophisticated approaches like, uh, you know, we use bronchial thermoplasty for asthma and, and it's used in asthma for its effects on the smooth muscle. But um, it, it also causes a denudation of the, the epithelium, not in the trachea, obviously. But the, the short answer, I think, is we don't really yet have the precise tools to do this in larger animal models or in humans. And, and that's something that the field desperately needs to prioritize is, um, is you know, very well understood, controlled um, methods of injuring the airways that would be tolerated um, to advance these studies. And I'm not saying doing this in patients yet, I'm saying just to actually start developing the overall approach. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's important to get those, those next steps and continue to advance the models. Um, a couple more questions are coming in actually. It's great from the audience. Um, so Rob Teague asked, um, with different donors, have you been um, begun to identify differences in the ability of iPSCs to develop IBS, IBCS? Um, so from the iPSCs into the basal ones. In addition, do you, some of these have less or more potential to develop um, alley cultures? Um, he was interested in the individual genetic diversity, and maybe that how, how that might affect the ability to generate and recover airway structures. Yeah, that's a really great question that actually gets to some, some really quite um, significant issues with the platform overall. So do we see differences? donor to donor, absolutely. Even in the early stages of the protocol, we see differences in how efficient different iPSC lines differentiate into lung. It's what has really kind of uh, essentially uh, made us take this approach that I didn't really go into in the, in the details of the talk where 
we, we've developed surface markers at various stages of the protocol to overcome the inefficiencies that we see so we can always purify a, a pure population of, of cells. But there, there are definitely differences in what actually causes these differences is still uncertain in, in the field. If it's something specific to the genetic background or something specific that happened during reprogramming, it's still uh, very, very difficult to resolve in our field. But essentially by using surface markers, we're able to overcome some of it. Does some of this lead to defects in differentiation? I don't, I don't know the answer to that yet because uh, all, almost all the iPSC lines that we have differentiated in this protocol, which is upwards of, I think probably 12 now at this point, all of them have ultimately been able to generate high quality ALI cultures bar one that we don't understand why that one line did not generate high quality ALI cultures. But it gets to a bigger issue. So if you're now actually trying to use this, this model to say, model the differences between Delta 508 patients, the same mutation, but we all know that they're a cl clinically heterogeneous population. Um, can you use this model to, to interrogate that heterogeneity, given that there's already some inherent uh, differences in the protocol? The, the long answer is that's going to take a lot of work and a lot of different samples to get, get to that ultimate point. The good news is there's lots and lots more people getting into this field uh, than there were five years ago. So hopefully we'll move move towards that. Yeah, that might be an interesting you know, study if you look at the you know the sibling studies that were done with, with cystic fibrosis in the past from a genetic standpoint and the diversity there. So that, that might yeah. be always be an interesting way to go about it. So yeah. Um, all right. Uh, next question. Uh, this was just a basic question on the iPSCs. Does the cell source um, matter for directed differentiation? Uh, that's a very good question, and that um, that comes up quite a lot. And I think there the answer is yes and no. Um, so uh, I think around 2011, if I'm remembering correctly, two seminal papers came out trying to address this. And essentially what they showed was that the cell type of origin did make a difference initially. Uh, when you looked at the uh, epigenetic landscape of these cells, there was clearly a difference early after reprogramming, but this went away with passaging. And so after passage 10, we don't see um, a significant difference depending on the cell type of origin. But it's a very relevant question because we routinely make these cells from either fibroblasts or peripheral blood on nuclear cells. And more recently, we've been making them from, from primary lung cells to have matched controls and I do also will just add that I think the technology has really evolved since those studies a decade ago. So I, the, that information may evolve somewhat as well. Another question from Rohit, uh, great talk. Usually chronic lung disease involves multiple cells that undergo reprogramming to lead to the pathogenesis. Um, you know, so do you think that focusing on just epithelial cells could lead to therapeutic breakthroughs or you know, multifaceted approach is warranted? And I think this is kind of goes back to some of the original questions. Yeah, I think uh, it's a great question, and I think it's it, it's always going to be a multifaceted uh, approach. Um, I think in some of those chronic lung diseases, one of the real headaches, actually, when you think about the last few decades of work, one of the real headaches has been trying to decipher the noise of the multiple cell types because we're relying on bulk tissues and BAL samples and, and serum samples, and, and um, with the advent of single-cell RNA sequencing, we're finally able to kind of break down some of that, um, that, that noise. Um, but I think a multifaceted approach is the way to go. And there's, I, I believe strongly that being able to have this reductionist approach has clear role complementary with other, with other platforms and approaches. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Um, another more general question, just kind of on the on the modeling and, and the composition of things. So they were uh, wondering, is the composition of the underlying matrix, can that impact differentiation and phenotypes of the iPSCs? And if so, what cell types are producing which specific matrix molecules? Is that essential to, to your models? That is, that is probably essential. And um, it's I would say overall, it's an understudied area. It's a great question. Um, I think most of our platforms are, uh, you know, that I and my colleagues are using rely on on, on Matrigel or, or pretty universally used um, extracellular matrix molecules. 
not specifically guided by the makeup of the lung at that specific developmental time point. But I think that is going to turn out to be important. Perhaps the best example I can give is that during the differentiate, a classic paper in our field was studying um, iPS cells coded on different stiffnesses, which clearly altered the differentiation trajectory of those cells just based on how stiff the matrix was. Um, and so I think it's very important, but um, understudied, and we're still at the point where we're using pretty, pretty simple um, matrix culture platforms, but um, hopefully with the help of people on this uh, call and, and others in the field will become much more, um, you know, much more precise and uh, relevant to the in vivo situation. Yeah, you have a lot of people that have stayed around for the questions. So obviously a lot of people are, are interested in this, enjoyed their talk, so. Yeah, I love the questions, great. Um, another audience question uh, from Thomas, um, are the isolated cells grown in the optimal me media environment for their growth or in the environment they live in the like disease lung tissue? You know, so how yeah. could these optimal conditions differentiate and affect the readout? So. Mm, that's, that's also a great question. They're, like the primary cells, they're cultured in conditions that have been developed really to optimize the ability to ma maintain them in vitro. They're clearly artificial. Um, actually, there's an argument to be made that the, the, the culture format that we use for the gold standard primary human bronchial epithelial cells is really not physiologically um, normal either because it's really like a, a activating an injury model where it's totally not normal to have your basal cells proliferate like crazy, like crazy. Um, uh, and so that, that in and itself is not that physiologically relevant, but I think we're, we're just limited by, you know, the current state of the platform. But I guess to think how the, the environment that they live in in the diseased lung tissue is a really interesting thought. So uh, it gets to whether, you know, building more complex models where you're actually building in immune lineages or smooth muscle lineages that are, uh, you know, I guess it, thinking about CF or asthma that are, are key players uh, in the disease pathogenesis, or as if we think of IPF, how, how does the stiffness of the surrounding environment alter the, the effect of, uh, or behavior of, of some of these cells, I think are all uh, ripe questions for the future. So a lot of the, you know, the diseases we talked about here today are, are chronic lung diseases. And obviously this is a, you know, a snippet in, in an area to look at. Um, is there a role, do you think, for this in acute lung injuries? You know, is this a, a relevant, I mean, it's probably a relevant model, but, you know, is this a feasible model for looking at acute lung injuries or do you think a better model for chronic lung, lung injuries? Well, I'd say, I think you could make a strong argument that it's a better model for acute lung injuries overall, because chronic, chronic lung disease just, uh, I mean, simply put, takes years and years to develop and is usually a very complex interplay of environment, genes, different cell types, and uh, acute illnesses are probably better suited to this model. So I'm, uh, we, are, we are working on SARS-CoV-2 response of airway epithelial cells as an example. I see Dr. Goto, um, who is one of the leaders in the field based in Japan, has, has done similarly. Um, and I think, I'm trying to think of other good examples of, uh, of acute injuries, but asthma exacerbations, um, uh, ARDS, the initial response of the type two cells to acute injury. I think these are, these are questions that, that are probably overall better suited to this platform than chronic, chronic complex lung diseases. And certainly the, the ability to cryopreserve cells and, and get this, you know, models in the hands of other investigators is really an important breakthrough. So, um, all right. Um, oh, it looks like we had another couple of questions that just came in. Um, so do you have any studies of different stages of development and the response to different viral illnesses um, like RSV or rhinovirus and the differentiation of iPSCs? So obviously you're looking at SARS-CoV, but... Yeah, that's a great question. I, I can, um, we have not done work in that area. I can point you towards Dr. Hans Schnuck has a paper from 2017 where they did look at RSV um, ability to infect iPSC-derived um, lung 
But I think if I'm understanding the question, maybe you're hinting at whether there's differences at different developmental stages. And um, I don't think anyone's looked at different developmental stages. Uh, I guess it's an interesting question in terms of if you could make lung epithelial cells that represent you know, late fetus versus early newborn versus a childhood. Uh, I don't think we're at the stage yet where we've been able to, to do that, but, um, but, but there are some initial uh, papers describing describing at least the feasibility of infecting iPSC-derived lung cells with RSV. I think particularly in the context of asthma, where we, you know, we see folks that seem to have a different trajectory and a lot of epidemiologic literature based on their early exposure to viruses, that could be a really important yeah. way to Exactly, to model and that. How, how that interplays with some of these genetic uh, susceptibility traits. Sure, sure. Um, another question um, from Caroline. Um, have you looked at the longevity of the differentiated cells in, in ALI culture and compared it to the cellular turnover that's expected in the human lung? So how does how do those compare? Oh, that's a great question. I uh, we have not compared it to you know directly to the human lung. Um, the the primary cell cultures are um, very well established and have been around for a lot longer. And if you if you take primary human basal cell cultures, they can be maintained for, for over a year uh, while maintaining um, a beautiful morphology. Uh, our cells are not, as con not nearly as consistent in that we've seen ALI cultures that we've been able to maintain for over three months. Um, but we also have, have issues sometimes in the earlier stages of the protocol where they are they're not as durable and we're not sure whether that's because we're relying on an adult basal cell medium that hasn't been optimized for our cells or there's, there's something else that we're missing. Um, but the turnover compared to the actual adult lung, I don't know, perhaps somebody on the call has a better idea of the turnover rates than the adult lung. I would, I would guess that it's a much faster turnover but I'm, um, I'm, than the adult lung under homeostatic conditions, but I don't have a definite answer for you. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very tough question, but you've had some some great questions here. Appreciate the audience. Um, I think we'll we'll probably wrap up here. I don't see any other cultures coming in or questions coming in, but um, if there's any other thoughts from the audience, please uh, feel free to chime in here. But um, I'll remind everybody that since this was recorded, please you know share this with your your colleagues that weren't able to attend today. Um, if you have further questions for Dr. Hawkins, you can connect through the ATS platform itself and send a message or certainly um, on Twitter. Um, he's on social media. That's another way and email, obviously. I'll thank the audience again and thank you, Finn, for this great talk and, um, and for all these uh, great thought on the question and answer session here. So appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation and thanks for all the great questions. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of the conference.